Good afternoon, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, even though I admit this does seem a little strange because I'm just looking at my PowerPoint slide instead of all of your wonderful faces, like uh, I'm used to seeing it at Capitol Conference. But as uh, Jana said, we're going to talk about the best practices for teaching oral interpretation. And we're going to do that by, you're going to get to see two different performances by two of my national uh, winners. Uh, early in the program, we'll listen to Johnny Vasayo, and then later at the very end, we'll listen to Jaquasi Mentor. And you can see that they are have both national winners. I'm very proud of both of them. Um, and then there's an overview of what we will be looking at this afternoon. We're going to cover the basics of oral interpretation, some of the unwritten rules that you need to make sure your students know. Uh, we'll look at uh, some suggestions for how you can make coaching sessions better, and then how to help your students conquer their nerves at, at the end. So that's kind of an overview of what, what we'll be listening, uh, what you'll be listening to and what I will be, be teaching you. Uh, the first thing we're gonna, going to do, I'm going to start off by performance, but before I switch the screen around, I want to tell you just a little bit about Johnny. Uh, Johnny is a sophomore or was a sophomore here at, at TJC. We're in the summer now, so I have to admit that he has graduated from, uh, from my college. Um, Johnny had uh, six events qualified for nationals this year before, of course, COVID kept us from going. Uh, he's the first student I've ever had that had six events qualified. So, so uh, he's pretty, um, pretty amazing performer. And I'm going to have him. I'm going to share a video of him doing his prose, which was his first event that he qualified for nationals this year. He qualified it, I think, in just four tournaments. I mean, it was it was pretty pretty fast. Uh, so bear with me. This is one of the times that we're kind of going to uh, chuckle along. I'm going to have to stop the share for a second and, and bring up his video. And of course, I'm blind, so I have to uh, get my glasses on here. And... Can you see the video? Yes. Okay, good. Then here he goes. I grew up in the occupation of my country. And as a child, I remember my dad being gone a lot. Now the subject of my dad's whereabouts was somewhat taboo in my household because my mom told us that we were never to ask of him. So we never did. And, and you know, sometimes I wondered if he cared about me. But in the meantime, there were rumors of a regime change, which was devastating news for my dad, who was a high-ranking officer of the current regime. Historically, the new regime takes over by violently dismantling the old regime, so my parents were desperate to get out of the country. But they couldn't, because the government put a lockdown on everybody's visas. They needed everyone to stay and fight the war for them. So the only way to get out of the country was on forged papers. So after a daring escape in the middle of the night, my parents, my brother and I migrated to the US on forged papers and we asked for political asylum. That meant that we could stay here temporarily while they reviewed our case. They gave us work permits, driver's license, and oh, even a social security card. So uh, all of us just started, well, working. <laughs> Immigration is obviously big news today. You can't turn on a TV or a computer without seeing some new headline. According to the 2019 current population survey, immigrants are over 13% of our overall population. At the same time, according to the Washington Post of the same year, the United States supported more than 356,000 people last year alone. These are fathers, mothers, and children. Sometimes our compassion for these immigrants gets lost in the media frenzy and political rhetoric. 
but we should not forget what is written on the statue of liberty. The Woven Prose, A New Home by Dori Samadazi Banner and El Amor de la Playa by Rafael Olguin. Because it's time we realize that most immigrants can't go back home. They are home. Well, fast forward five years and our lives have gotten so normal that the biggest thing on my mind at the time was wondering how I could get my mom to extend my curfew and, and let me stay out late. And next thing you know, I'm at my first job at, well, the men's warehouse, and, and I receive a phone call from my dad. And oh, I could tell by the excitement in his voice that there was something going on at home. He's all like, you need to come home right away because there's a letter from still thinking about you all, haven't forgotten about you. <laughs> so I rush home and I find that uh, my brother, because my them too, and, and I remember all three of them hovering over me, rushing me, saying, come on, come on, read it, what does it say? What does it say? So, you know, I only have time to, to quickly read the highlights. And, and he said that our appointment had been moved to next week and that we need to bring illegal documents or family photos and things that are important to us. And then I remember all four of us just jumping up and down thinking that, that this is it, you know? Uh, this is the appointment we've all been waiting for. So the day of our appointment, we drive about 45 minutes to downtown and, and we go up to this big government building. Upstairs, the immigration officer is waiting for us and he opens the doors. But the moment that the doors opened up, we felt like we were in the wrong place because everyone was visibly upset. I mean, some of the people there were, were still crying, you know. We, we were told to, to just sit down until your last name is called, and so we did. After a while, my dad asked me if I could go up to a, a security officer and ask him what we we're here for and how long it was going to take. So, so I go up to an immigration officer and I'm like, hey, excuse me, sir, do, do you know how long our appointment might take? Because my dad, he, he needs to go back to work. And, and the guard says, your dad will go back to work, all right? Just not in this country. And, and you know, for, for a moment, my, my heart drops. You know, be, because going back was not an option for us because we were now considered traitors of, of the regime and, and we would get arrested the moment we got off the plane. So, you know, I, I sat down and I hesitantly told my dad this and then he lost all the color to his face. And after 45 minutes, a man walks into the room and he calls us by our last name. So. We are following him, and, and he leads us into this room. And a judge is sitting there, and, and he's an older gentleman, and he's really intense. I mean, he won't even smile at us. He begins to ask my dad questions. Really, the meaning questions like, do I understand correctly that you came here on forged papers? And, and my dad would be like, well, yes. And, and then he would go on to this long explanation. And then the judge would cut off my dad, and he would say, I just want to hear yes or no. I don't care about an explanation. And the conversation would go on like this, back and forth, and it's not going well at all until the judge finally says, you know, here in the United States, we don't give citizenship to people who break the law. We can't, and I won't. Oh, no. and, and as soon as I translate this, I, I just, I just start praying. But, but when I open my eyes, I, I see my dad rising out of his seat. He starts unbuckling his belt, which at this point I'm thinking he's completely losing his mind. I'm not sure what he's doing. But, but then he, he lifts up the right side of his shirt. And in his native tongue, he looks up at the judge and says, Esto, es que me hicieron a mí. This is what they did to me. And he is pointing to a five inch knife scar. My dad then turns around and pushes down his pants and says, Esto, es que me hicieron a mí. This is what they did to me. 
and he is pointing to three gunshot wounds. And, and, and my dad, he, he takes off his shoe and he points to his foot and he says, Esto, es que me hicieron a mí. This is, is what they did to me. And, and he is pointing to his toenails, which, which she tried to take out with pliers. And you know, I remember thinking, I, I know I'm hearing everything I'm hearing, but but everything wasn't registering because because as I was translating all these horrible things, I I was learning for the first time about my dad's whereabouts. All these years ago where, where I didn't know where my dad was, wondering if he cared about me. He was in prison being tortured. My dad continues to tell the judge, it is so easy for you to judge me. You sit in that seat and you wear that robe, but have you come down on this side and, and look at me one man to another, you would see that everything I did, I did to save my children. I had no other choice. And you may deny this right now, but had it been you, I know you would have done the same thing. If you have to show the American public that you could not take it easy on us, lo entiendo. So send me that. Please, please let my children stay. Please give them a new hope. And my dad puts his head down. And, and, and the judge leaves. After about 45 minutes, the judge comes back and, and I notice that he does not have his robe on. He goes up to his chamber and he grabs something and, and he starts walking back toward us. The, my dad looks up at the judge and, and then the judge says, let me see your hand. And, and my dad shows him his hand and the judge says, I would like you to be the one who stamps your children's paper. And together, they stamp both our papers. And when they move their head, it says a sign of grit. The judge then looks down at my dad and he puts his hand on his shoulder and he says, welcome to a man. I grew up in the occupation How? of my... Sorry. <laughs> Hold on. Gotta find my... Can you see the PowerPoint again, Jana? I don't know if y'all can hear me or not. You're muted, we but I think read. I got it. I got it. Can you see it now? Okay. I I still, I'm sorry, I got tears in my eyes a little bit because that piece gets to me every single time, <laughs> every single time. Um, now we're going to move on and uh, talk about some best practices for unwritten rules. Um, that's actually not the first thing that we talk about. So I must have somehow jumped, jumped a page. I'm so sorry. You know, this is this is what you get, right? For for uh, doing something for the first time. There we there we go. We're going to talk about basics first. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sure that the majority of you know, unless you're a brand new coach, that for UIL, you do two different categories for both prose and poetry. That means, of course, that your students have two different selections that they're doing in prose or two different selections for poetry. And I'm not going to spend time going into the, uh, I think they're wonderful categories that, that we have going on right now. Um, you can find information on the UIL website, or you can you can certainly email me uh, 
later on in the summer and I, I will be happy to give you additionals but but that is obviously one of the first basics that you have to know and you have to understand if you're going to be be coaching or, or teaching oral interpretation you also need to know about the documentation uh, for the categories and this has become so much easier over the years with the wonderful documentation forms that Jana has uh, devised and they are also available on the UIL website so you should look those over uh, one of the best practices that I would suggest is as you're getting the categories together for the students uh, do the documentation early on and put it in like a folder or a notebook so that uh, the students have that when it comes around to time for UIL uh, districts and they have they already have their information together and you're not having to try to rush and put it together at the last minute because I, I, I know at least all of us are so busy uh, we are guilty of sometimes being forced to do things at the last minute um, one of the things in the in these categories this year is that there is a required introduction for, for all of the pieces and you know years ago uh, introductions were usually just the title of the piece and the author and that and that was it uh, but uh, a real best practices is that in the introduction you want to explain uh, the connection between the student and the uh, material or you want to give the social significance of this information like what you just heard uh, Johnny do in his performance he talked about immigration in in his introduction and he made uh, we talked about this and we knew it was a risk that whenever he he did uh, his tagline that it was about time that we understood that these people weren't looking that they were already home you know and he made that made the gesture that that they are home that the immigrants are home and we knew that that was a political thing but he was willing to take that to take that risk because he felt so strongly about uh, this piece and he had some uh, uh, and of course this is college this was not a high school piece we he didn't have to tell his personal experience <clears throat> with this topic but if he <clears throat> had been required to do that he could have easily done so because his parents are from Puerto Rico and uh, so this this had a lot of uh, and some of well one of his parents Puerto Rico and one is from Cuba and so the Cuba family really had a lot of uh, <clears throat> that background of the regime changes and torture and whatnot so he really had a a lot of personal feeling with this <clears throat> then of course uh, the last thing that I've listed on this slide is that it has to the performance has to be under seven minutes that's including the introduction and the performance you know what I've learned by coaching over the last 40 some odd years is that for most students performances get longer the longer that you have them so I would try to cut the performance or have the performance be at only about six and a half minutes uh, max whenever you're starting out with them so that they have that flex time of 30 seconds so that uh, they're not going to run over time whenever they get real emotional. Um, because goodness knows i can i could tell you a lot of stories about johnny's pieces of how we had to keep cutting and keep cutting and keep cutting <laughs> to keep his under under time uh we do have longer in college by the way if, in case you think that that piece was over seven it was because we have 10 minutes in in college uh which is a nice a, a nice amount of time but uh, seven minutes you can still tell a really good story so are are put together a great uh, poetry piece so i think it's it's plenty of time uh, but those are the basic rules and some some basic hints for you so now let's move on to looking at what i call the unwritten rules uh, these are these are 
expectations that are, they're not a requirement. You don't have to do these things, but this is what uh, almost all of your judges are going to expect and they're going to uh, want your students to do. And the first is that they have a black book, uh, a, a folder, and that was what you saw Johnny use in his, uh, his presentation. He had a black folder. Uh, why, why black? Because it is a, a color that kind of blends in with anything else. I mean, if you have a, even a dark green book or a blue book or any of the other colors, it tends to draw attention to itself. But black, uh, the black color kind of blends in in the, in the background is what I would suggest. And there are places that you can buy black books, but I will tell you that a lot of them, um, they are hard to find, the smaller size. Uh, black Book Depot is one of the best places that I know. That's where we buy all of our books because you want them to have the, I think you can see me in a tiny window. I don't, <laughs> so I'm gonna show you this. You want to have the spine in the center. Uh, you don't want the spine to be on one or the other side of the folder. You want it to be on the spine because that makes it so much easier for your students to hold and to manipulate as they're, as they're closing your folder and opening your folder and stuff. So uh, make sure that you find the right type of black books and you can't, you can't just run out to Walmart or to Office Depot usually to get those. You usually have to order them uh, from a special order. And that's why I said Black Book Depot. But I admit Black Book Depot is a little pricey, so there may be some cheaper places that you can look around and find. Now the, the term next term on there is slicks. Uh, that's plastic sheet protectors. Uh, again, this is certainly not a requirement, but oh my gosh, it makes it so much easier for your students to perform when they're practicing over and over and over again if those pages are in plastic protective sheets. And there are several different kinds, and again, these are hard to find. Uh, Black Book Depot also has those available. I buy some of Black Book Depots, but I also uh, order some special from just a, a office supply place that are a little thicker. It kind of depends on what style. I, half of my students will prefer one and half will prefer another. Uh, but here's the, here's the hint of what I'm going to tell you on, on your slicks. Slicks, I, they're just called slicks because the page is slick. That's, <laughs> that's, that's it. Um, Put some extra black cardstock inside the slick rather than, than just having just having the page. So as you can see on this one, this is the 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 piece that the student would be performing, but there are extra pieces of of cardstock to make this thicker, and that makes it easier to turn for the student. Uh, so usually about two pieces is enough. Uh, two pieces of cardstock will makes it makes it easier to turn and to hold. Another hint that I would have for you is about page turns. Don't just fill up a page. This I mean students are going to type. You know they're going to type their pieces and they're just going to put however much they could get on a whole page and then they'll just go on over to the next page. Well. No, you need to really think where you want your page turns to be because you don't want your audience paying attention to your page turns unless you're using them for some um, purpose, like if, you're, if there's a long uh, time. I don't know if you, uh, hopefully you didn't notice, but John, but Johnny uh, would do a page turn before he would say, and 45 minutes later, you know, when there was a time transition, that was an appropriate place for him to turn his page. Uh, so you, you don't want page turns to be in the middle of some action. 
like if the uh, if the narrator of the story or the or whoever in the po in the poem that the student is reciting if if they are are describing something some action or something that happens you don't want to stop in the middle of it and have a page turn you know so so do the page turns when at appropriate points and that makes a big difference between labeling your student as a novice to someone with more experience if, if they know how to do their page turns correctly. Um, I don't want to speak a lot about using the book as a prop, but I do think it's something that is definitely, it's always asked, people always ask, you know, well, you're not really supposed to because it's not acting. Well, what you just saw Johnny do uh, he he used his book when when the judge and the father stamped their papers and he actually came down with his hand and stamped the papers inside his own black book and I don't think that that's uh, I don't think that's acting I think that that's what we would do if we were in a conversation with somebody else we would probably be making a motion we would be doing something so so i think it's perfectly okay to do and uh, but you want to make sure that you're just not drawing attention to it that it's something that it's something subtle um, i could talk about that for a long time but that, but that's <laughs> i'll stop with that and i'll see if y'all have any questions about about that later uh, dressing professionally is definitely a, a must when you get into def definitely regional and state competition, but I think it helps the students feel better about themselves if they are dressed professionally, even at an invitational tournament early on. Uh, yes, it can be expensive, but you can get a lot of great clothes at uh, Goodwill or, or any other type of outlet store uh, where they have resale clothes. Uh, we send, send our students on a lot of different places. We take them a lot of different places. We've worked out a deal with some local stores about how to get men's suits cheaper. Uh, but it is it makes the students feel more confident if they are dressed professionally plus in my opinion this is one of the most important things that we're teaching these students we're teaching them how to act professional how to be professionals in stressful situations and so knowing how to dress knowing how to do these things is is very important uh, I will tell you uh, that it is no longer necessary, in my opinion, for women to wear hose and high heels. Now, Jana's probably having a heart attack right now because I'm saying that. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, there has, there's been so much research that's been done on how high heels are really, really bad for women's, uh, women's health and their, and their legs and their feet that, uh, uh, at least on the college circuit, we are not requiring uh, girls. To, now, a lot of the girls still wear them. Um, I will tell you, they, they say that they feel better when they're in high heels. So, okay, uh, wear high heels. But uh, probably, it's almost split on my team. About half wear flats and half wear high heels. And I just let it be their choice. Uh, totally their choice. It's something, it's totally up to them. But I think what is not optional, what we all need as, as coaches, uh, is one of our best practices is to teach students how to behave professionally when they are a performer and when they are an audience member. And this is not something that they intuitively know because most of our students have been raised in front of a screen like we're all sitting in front of right now. They've been raised in front of a screen and so they don't necessarily know how to uh, watch the performers and, and to nod or to, 
to laugh whenever it's something funny. You know, they 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 need to they need to know how to do that and and what is accepted and what is is not. Um, that's one of the and you want to teach them everything about about not just in the in the room, uh, but even at awards. You want to teach them, you know, how they should behave professionally. What what is your school's standard of professionalism in those in those situations? Because they're not going to know it uh, by themselves. It's something that we have to that we have to teach them. Uh, before I leave this about behaving professionally, I do want to tell you one story of one of my students, and this was many years ago, but he was a brilliant performer in our, in our offices uh, when we were practicing. He was brilliant, but he would never break at a tournament. And we were like, what is going on? You know, what happens? We'd read his, read his ballots and we couldn't really figure out, you know, what they, they, they just had kind of, all the judges that saw him just said, well, you know, he just wasn't, wasn't uh, the best in the room. And I just couldn't figure it out. So my colleague and I decided that we'd go watch him. Uh, so I paid not to judge so that I could follow him around <laughs> to his rounds at a tournament and see what he was doing. And I found out that what he was doing was out in the audience before it was his turn to speak he was behaving like a nervous wreck. He was uh, jittery, he, his legs were bouncing up and down, he was looking from side to side, he was, uh, he was not a horrible audience member as far as being distracting, but he was definitely looked like he was a nervous wreck. And even when they called him when it was his time, he stood up, uh, he, he readjusted his jacket several times. Uh, he kind of turned his folder several times looking to make sure it was right. Again, looking like a nervous wreck before he walked up to the front of the room. And then when he opened his folder, he was calm and natural. But what was that impression that he'd already given the judge, you know, was that he didn't know what he was doing, <laughs> that he wasn't uh, a competent performer. And, and, I, and as soon as we talked to him about it, and we, um, and I do mean night and day after that first thing, I, I, I said, okay, here's what you need to do for the next round. Guess what? Not only did he break at that tournament, uh, but he won third place. And that was the first time that he'd won all year. And so, and then he went on to win uh, a national title as well. So sometimes behavior is not just manners. It's also about how to control yourself to be a better performer, all right? So that's some of my suggestions for best practices for the unwritten rules. Now um, I'll try to, to give you some ideas about coaching uh, methods, per se. Uh, all of us will coach in different ways. Everybody has a different style. Uh, some people are very hands-on. I mean, they they direct how you sh how the student should say every single syllable. You know, every single you know. Then turn your head slightly this way. Or, you know, they'll they'll be very very uh, prescriptive. While other coaches, I think, are are much more hands-off. You know, that they kind of let the students uh, guide themselves and the, uh, through. Uh, just giving them some questions and, and thoughts. And then uh, like, I, I consider myself, I do both. I'm, I'm, I'm both, I'm kind of right, right in the middle. And I, I, that's probably where a lot of us fall is, is somewhere in, in the middle. But I think you have to know what your style is. You have to intentionally make some decisions. And the Bottom line also is that not every student can be reached the same way. Uh, I actually give my students a form that they fill out at the beginning of the year, and I'm asking, I ask them what their goals are, I ask them, 
you know, what they want to get out of the activity, what events they think they want to, to perform in, that, those sort of questions. And then I ask them questions like, what motivates you? What makes you work harder? What makes you reach your goals? And by reading their answers, I kind of can tailor make my coaching sessions for those students because I know from at least their, if they were describing themselves accurately, then, then I think uh, I, I know how to reach out to them. Uh, I also encourage you to make deadlines uh, and to make requirements, but I'm going to talk about those together. But uh, you want to be realistic uh, and you want to be realistic about your own time as well. Like don't ask all of your interpreters to have the first draft of their introduction written by Friday if you know yourself that you have something major planned to do over the weekend and you're not going to be able to look at them all over the weekend. Uh, so, you know, don't, don't unrealistically set deadlines and, and requirements. Make sure that they, that uh, you're going to be able to give the students the feedback that they need as soon as possible. Um, and that kind of leads into, you know, knowing your limits in, in several different ways. Like uh, we have to be good time managers. If we're going to be teachers and coaches at the same time, time, which all of us are, uh, then you have to be a, a good manager of your time. And all of us necessarily aren't. Um, I know I certainly say yes to way too many things. Uh, uh, but you, you got, there are ways that you can kind of take some of the pressure off of you, depending on the size of your team and the experience of your team, you can use some peer coaching as well, asking students to uh, listen to one another and to help one another. I know my team over the last few years has developed a, we have an oral interpretation night and we don't have it every week by any means. And I don't do this. Uh, the students do it themselves, but they have an oral interp night where they perform for each other and they critique one another and they help one another. And, and I have seen a big uptick on how well we've done at tournaments since they started this, this practice. Uh, because I think getting encouragement from your peers can be very, very uh, helpful and supportive of the students' egos as well. Um, also have the students make videos that is some time where you can uh, watch the videos yourself or you can watch uh, watch them with the students perhaps if we're back to having face-to-face -face <laughs> coaching sessions i'm not i'm not sure i don't you know, none of us have a crystal ball we don't really know what's going to happen this this fall but i know that when the uh, uh, pandemic set in uh, we were Man, we were so excited about our upcoming national tournaments because I had more students than ever before had qualified events, and we were so looking forward to going to uh, California for one national tournament and Albuquerque, New Mexico for another. And then, of course, the pandemic hit, and uh, fortunately, a guy in California decided to put together an online virtual tournament. And so my assistant coach and I uh, selected three of our team members. We decided to go small. We didn't want to do the whole team because we knew how time intensive it was going to be. But for uh, about three weeks, we intensely coached those students by Zoom. Uh, through, virtually. And we learned a lot from doing it. We knew that the students were going to be performing uh, in Zoom. And so we needed to coach them how to do that. And uh, it was, it's a great, wonderful teaching. Uh, not only, but not only did we, the, the video that you saw of Johnny, that's one of his last practices videos that he did 
before he competed at nationals virtually. Um, and, and he asked me, he said, can I just send you that one? And I said, sure, you know, you can. Even though I'll tell you that there, there are several things we corrected from that one video. <laughs> I can tell you, tell you that there were, his, his focus wasn't exactly right in, <laughs> in some places, but uh, I'm, I'm, always, I'm always kind of picky. Um, I bet some of you are too as, as, as coaches. Uh, but I do think that uh, <clears throat> videos are a good way of coaching and can be just as effective, if not more so, uh, than uh, if you have them right in the same room with you. Um, but coaching, you know, all of us do it in a different way. All, some of us are more competitive than others. Uh, some of us are... You know, I, I will tell you, I, I say this and people don't really, I don't, some people have told me they don't really believe this, but I will tell you, as soon as I quit worrying about trophies, that's when my teams became competitive. I, I focus more on the students' personal improvement rather than whether they're going to win, win. Now, that's not necessarily true on the selection of their material. I admit, <laughs> I admit that uh, well, I'm kind of picky about that. Uh, but otherwise, it's, it's got to be about the, the student because that's what we're really here for is the education of the student. Okay, I think that's enough for best practices for coaching. Uh, let's look at... Uh, <laughs> this is something that I've really, really focused on uh, for, for most of my coaching career, but particularly the last five years, I've really, really focused on helping students uh, conquer their nervousness and learn how to be more self-confident. Now, Jana introduced me as just being an oral interpretation coach. Uh, actually, I, I have uh, a lot of debaters as well. And uh, one joke, of course, is that debaters don't get nervous. They're just too cocky to get ner nervous. And that uh, I don't know if that's true or not. I don't think it is because I've certainly helped a lot of debaters uh, get over some nerves that, that they probably wouldn't admit that that's what it was, but that's what their problem was in, in competition. Uh, but the top thing that I have on this list in front of you is positive presence. And uh, this is really one of the secrets of success of our team. Uh, we preach positive presence to the team at all times. That means from the time they get dressed in the morning at the tournament, they walk out to the van, we're driving to the school where we're gonna compete, uh, they're out looking at the postings of where they're gonna perform, what room, at what time. All the way through, they are practicing positive presence. They have to have a positive mindset that they are thinking positive things. If they find themselves thinking negative things, then they have to correct it immediately and start thinking positively. That positive presence, I think, is so, so important in making them successful. And I will tell you that uh, as long, I've been doing this positive presence probably for about almost 10 years now. And those students that are now, of course, functioning adults in the world, they will contact me uh, and tell me that that was the best lesson that they learned from being on the team about how to, how to stay positive and, and how to maintain positivity even in a stressful situation. So positive presence is, is definitely something that you can teach. Um, I think my students would tell you that I don't give many compliments. Uh, because I believe you, your compliments need to be very sincere when you give them. And so if you're just gushing over a student all the time, I, you know, I think that that might fall on deaf ears pretty, pretty soon. So I think you should uh, uh, give very sincere compliments, but definitely they need to hear them. 
they need to hear them or they need reassurance that they're that they're going to be okay and if they need reassurance one of the best ways to reassure them is to remind them how hard they have prepared how hard did they work for this you know that that they know what they're doing they've had this piece for x amount of time you know they've gone over it you practice with it uh, reminding them of how they are prepared and that they're just as worthy as anybody else in the room so that they can project that image of confidence so that they can have that positivity uh, around them and um, that projected image of confidence sometimes sometimes talk with the, the students that seem to have the most nerves i actually talk to them very specifically about that uh, at home, not at the tournament, but <laughs> at home, talk to them about what does a positive, uh, a, a person with a lot of confidence, what do they look like? You know, how do they act? And get them to talk through it because a lot of times they just really hadn't thought about it. And then whenever you can tell them stories that, hey, you know, research says that if you pretend to be confident, you actually begin to feel more confident. There's a lot of research that supports that. And once they try that and they see it, uh, it really does begin to work for them. We do a lot of student showcases too. Uh, we have our, not only you know, do they do that on their own, but sometimes we'll, we'll have them, we'll have a work day and we'll have the students do a showcase where they're performing their best two minutes you know maybe we don't have time to listen to everybody's complete speech but you know give us your best two minutes and um, I think that that they have to demonstrate that they can project that image of confidence just by going to that best two minutes one of the best practices I think for for coaching uh, as you're working with some a student that's very nervous is that you use your authority as the coach you know you remind them that you do know what you're saying because you have the experience but you do it with a lot of warmth and a, a, a good positive imagery energy yourself so that that's what that authority warmth and energy means that you want to uh, make sure that that uh, you're doing things um, sincerely and that you have the student's best interests in heart. Now, if you have a student that just has a lot, a lot of anxiety, then you're going to want to teach them the STOP method. And this method uh, I, I took from listening to a talk by Deepak Chopra. And of course, y'all know him as the one of the meditation gurus in the world. And uh, he says that stop means that this is a very easy thing that you can teach somebody how to do, that if they are having an anxiety attack, if they're, or if they're just feeling really, really nervous and they feel like they're about to lose it, that they need to stop themselves. And that's the S, take three deep breaths. And you know, that's not the, it's the you know, nice, slow, deep breaths. And then they need to observe themselves. They need to think about what's happening in the situation and what's happening in their body. You know, what's, what, uh, what are their observations about what's going on? Why are they in this state of anxiety? And then the P stands for proceed with kindness and compassion toward yourself. You know, don't beat yourself up just because you got a nervous attack. Doesn't mean that, that you're terrible. It doesn't mean that you're not prepared. It doesn't mean any of those negative things. You want to be kind to yourself. You want to be compassionate with yourself. And I, I could tell you a ton of stories, but, uh, over the last, and, and I, some of you may have heard me at Capital Conference, the last two years I've done sessions specifically on anxiety uh, with students because it is a, 
almost like a disease that's going on with our young people. They are a lot more anxious about things than they used to be. And there is some research, some new research coming out and pointing uh, fingers, of course, at our cell phones, that they are constantly comparing themselves to other people. And when you are in a constant state of comparison, it tends to make you anxious. Now that's a kind of a simplistic, but that is one reason that I ask my team not to do any social uh, media while we're at a tournament. Now, I don't make them give me their phones, even though I do know some coaches that do that, <laughs> but I don't make them give me their phones, but I just say on your, on your own, please don't get on Facebook, don't get on Snapchat, don't do Instagram while we're at a tournament. As soon as the tournament is over, you know, go for it. But uh, during the time, you know, d don't. Um, and I think I've seen a, a, a difference, a positive difference with that as well, that, that I have less cases. Um, I stopped myself, I started to tell you a story about, uh, I had two girls, they were on the team actually one year at the same time. Uh, and they are probably my two biggest cases of of anxiety that I've ever had. And the fact that we had two of them at the same time was pretty amazing. But uh, I mean, I really thought one girl, I thought, man, uh, not, uh, not only am I gonna send her to a counselor, but I, I'm afraid she's gonna be put on heavy drugs. I mean, I, I really, she was in bad shape. But uh, through a lot of, uh, she was willing to work and by going to a counselor and by uh, working with us on, on becoming a more positive person, she had just become so negative about herself. She was eating herself from the inside out. And you may have students at your school that are like that too. And I, I just tell you that there is a way they can learn how to uh, love themselves, but we don't necessarily have the time to be their counselor. You have to, you have to give them some guidance of how to get the, the help that they need. Um, but yeah, that is a part of teaching. That's a part of teaching oral and terp. Because folks, uh, you know, when you're doing an oral interpretation piece, you're dealing with a lot of emotion. You're dealing with a lot of things about yourself. And so sometimes these anxieties come about. Uh, but, it's, but it's okay, because uh, that's a way that students grow. So I would definitely uh, encourage you to teach the STOP method, because I do think that it, it can help them. In, uh, in tournament situations and in life. Um, okay, I've talked for a long time. I think y'all would like to hear another performance at this point. So we're going to um, unmute Jaquazy Mentor. Jaquazy was a freshman at TJC this year and he uh, is from Mount Pleasant and Jaquazy, uh, I'll just brag on him a little bit. Uh, he entered three events at this national virtual tournament and he made it to finals in all three events, prose, poetry, and dramatic interpretation. And I'm gonna have him do his prose for you today because he was national champion, <laughs> first, first place. And so I think uh, even though that's two proses, I figured that you, you would want to hear my national champions today. So, so Jaquazy, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, can everybody hear me pretty good? Yes. Yes. So I'm walking from Subway back to Millsaps College. It's nighttime, 
and I get about halfway past the cemetery when all of a sudden a red Corolla stops. A young brother, about two years younger than I am with the birdiest of bird's chest. I mean, baby, I can count every single one of his skinny, skinny ribs. Gets out of the car clutching a shiny silver gun. He comes towards me and I encourage him to do whatever he needs to do. He's patting me up and down for work study money that I don't have since our work study checks haven't come in yet. And I spent my last $20 on two of those veggie subs and extra large chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> but then all of a sudden he takes the gun off my chest and trots goofily back to the car. I mean, I don't know what was wrong with him that day, but what I do know is, is that a few months later, I own a dang gun. Now, I don't get the gun to defend myself against Goofy Brothers and Red Corollas. I get it because I am a black writer in Jackson, Mississippi. And some people just don't like the stories that I've been writing in the school newspaper. Gun control has been a stagnated discussion in America today. According to the United States Disease Prevention website, in one day, 310 people will become victims of gun violence. And more than half of those people are young black men. In a 2019 Al Jazeera article, it is revealed to us that it is easier for a black man to access a firearm than mental health services within the black community. This is just one story, because it is we call gun control what it is, an epidemic that needs a cure, not more discussion. How to slowly kill yourself and others in America. A remembrance by Kiese Langan. So I'm heading to my job at ton of fun. A fake Chuck E. Cheese behind North Park Mall. I have my ton of fun t-shirt on and it's a little bit tighter than the other guys that I work with, but I like to add just a little bit of bleach so I don't be musty. <laughs> and as I'm walking downstairs out of the out of my dorm into the parking lot, I um I noticed that some of the KAs and SIGs are out receiving their new members. And of course, as you and I both know, they have been drinking all night long. But, but as I get a little closer, I notice that some of them have on Afro wigs, Confederate flag capes, and blackface. And then one of them, he looks at me and um, he calls me a nigger. And then suddenly I have this strange feeling because, you know, I was not raised in an environment like this, but I know that I want to make those boys feel the way they have made me feel right here in this moment, but I know I will never be able to. So I go back into my dorm and I pick up my gun. But then I think of my grandma and how she would feel if I went back out there with a the dang gun. So, so I put the gun back on the table and I go to the corner of my closet and I pick up a small wooden t-ball bat and as I'm stepping down the stairs, some of the KAs and SIGs are talking crap about me as I step up, throw down the bat and tell them I don't need a bat to mess you up and I'm so mad and I'm so angry and the only thing that I want to do is to swing at them over and over again but then suddenly, The dean breaks up the fight, and the KAs and SIGs go back to receiving their new members. And I go to my job at ton of fun. But on my first break at work, I called the local, local no, news station to tell them about the things that are going on at Millsaps College on a Saturday morning. And thankfully, they're able to get a few of the guys in Confederate capes and Afro wigs and blackface. 
a few weeks later, um, Mama and I are sitting in President George Harmon's office, and he is angry at the fact that his school is all across television in the United States. He says that I will be suspended for a year for using racially insensitive language. Me. Apparently, Millsaps is trying to prove that they are a post-racist institution. Again, we're talking about me. He says that I can come back to Millsaps only after attending a year of therapy session for racially insensitive language. Me, not the white guys that are literally wearing Afro wigs and, and Confederate flag capes and blackface. On the way home, my mama, she's, she's so mad at me and she just keeps yelling and asking what happened back there. But honestly, I don't know. But you know, you know, really we're fighting because my mom has always taught me that growing up as a black man in this country means no hoodies in the wrong neighborhoods. No rolling stops at stop signs, you know, no dating white women, always speaking proper English in the presence of white folk. And, you know, really, my mom is mad at me because she has always taught me that being black in this country means that a white person will do anything and everything to take anything away from you. My mother does not teach me freedom. My mother teaches me survival. You know, she says that my granny is going to be so disappointed in me. Heartbroken. And for the first time in my life, I just sit there and sob. So, one morning, while mom's at work, lie in a bathtub of cold water, still sweating, singing love songs to myself. I pick up my gun and I put it to my head and I cock it. And I think, I want to hurt myself so much more than I am already hurting. And I'm not the smartest boy on this planet by a long shot, but even in my bunk, I know that easy remedies like eating your way out of sad, or, or lying your way out of sad, or sleeping your way out of sad, or shooting your way out of sad, are just easier, more acceptable ways for Black men in this country to kill ourselves. I am so sad. And I can't find a way out. But then I think of my granny. And I think of the feeling of being loved and seen by her. And I dropped the gun to the floor. A few weeks later, I get a letter in the mail saying that I have been accepted into Oberlin College and that I'm getting a boatload of financial aid. You know, I feel like the luckiest boy on this planet, not because I've been accepted into Oberlin, but because I've learned how to say no to death and yes to life. The day that I'm awarded the Benjamin Brown Award, named after a young man who was shot in the back of the head at a student protest in Jackson, Mississippi, I take the bullets out of my gun and I toss them into the reservoir. And I don't know what any of this means but I know that it is all true. 
and that growing up as a black man in Jackson, Mississippi, no, growing up as a black man in this country is so beautiful. Thank you. I had not thought about how that ending is so much more touching after the recent events that have gone on in our country. Uh, thank you, Jaquazi, very much for doing that live performance for us. You're welcome. Um, so we've looked at basics and unwritten rules and coaching tips and tips for how to help your students with nerves and anxiety. And I think Jana's going to give me some questions now. And maybe Jaquesi may hang around in case they have some for him. <laughs> 